Is democracy the ideal form of government? This is something that Muslims have to think about very carefully. We hear uh, from our context in the modern day about how democracy is supposed to be the best form of government, the most just form of government. But this claim can create doubt for Muslims. Why? Because democracy is not something that is advocated explicitly within the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet The Prophet didn't establish a representational democracy in Medina. The Khulafa al-Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs, didn't uh, establish a kind of democratic system with branches of government and so forth. So if this is the best form of government, then why wasn't it revealed? Why isn't it a part of guidance? Because why would we think that human beings could conceive of and think of and theorize and come up with a form of government that is better than what came to the Prophet ﷺ in the final revelation? How do we address this kind of doubt? Well, we have to, in my opinion, go and ask a very fundamental question. Why is democracy considered the best form of government? And if you take any kind of government class within grade school or college, what you'll hear is that one of the main features of democracies that make them superior and more just is the notion of checks and balances. What is checks and balances? The idea is that power is distributed across different branches within the government. And these three branches check each other's power so that not one group or one individual can monopolize power and exercise this kind of unfettered, unhindered authority over the rest of the nation. So in the United States, for example, you have the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. Basically the president, Congress, and Supreme Court, to make things very simple. And these three branches check each other's power and not one branch can just make decisions about what laws the country should follow or what wars should be fought and all of these kinds of major national decisions have to be made in light of all three branches, not just one branch making decisions for everyone. So this is checks and balances. And on paper, theoretically, it seems to make a lot of sense. The thing is that in Islam, we also have this notion of checks and balances. But the checks and balances that we find in Islam are much more real and tangible than the what I consider to be fake or superficial checks and balances found within uh, Western democracies in the modern day. So let me explain what I mean by this. If we look at the US government or the government of any Western nation that claims to be a democracy, we find a lot of corruption. We find a lot of corruption where you have lobbyists and different political parties and action groups that manipulate the branches of government in their favor. And so when we see, for example, in, in the US context, health insurance companies that will lobby Congress and will lobby the President of the United States, they are trying to influence these branches of government with money to make laws that will benefit the insurance companies financially. This is a type of corruption because these these uh, congressmen, the president, senators, they are supposed to represent the interests of people, but because of money, they are, end up representing the interests of the corporations that are lobbying them and paying them and so on and so forth. So it's very easy, as we see throughout US history, for interest groups 
to lobby and influence the different branches of government and this has a very bad effect and that's why we see so much injustice when we look at the history of the United States. Justice that anyone can recognize when we look at the genocide of the Native Americans, when we look at the oppression of African Americans, when we look at uh, atrocities like the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of the different atrocities that America has been involved with and war crimes throughout its history, even recently, look at the invasions of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, all of this happened with the branches of government all in agreement, all three branches. And so this idea that having three branches prevents uh, corruption and prevents atrocities and prevents genocide, this is disproven by American history itself. And we see that even up until this day when you have arguably one of the most corrupt presidents in Donald Trump. Now, someone could say that, Daniel, this is, you know, democracy that's gone wrong, but democracy in the ideal case works. It's supposed to work Nowadays, yeah, there's all kinds of problems, but those are not really essential to what democracy is. If we could have an ideal situation and if we just implement a few more anti-corruption laws or maybe anti-lobbying laws, legislation, then we wouldn't have these kinds of problems. This is a counter argument. So as critical thinkers, we have to anticipate this, this counter argument and give a response. So my response, and maybe you can have a different response if you think about it, is that no, there is a fundamental problem here with democracy because we have to ask, what are the laws of a democracy going to be based on? If they're going to be just based on popular opinion and people who are voting for uh, representatives in Congress or in the president, who are going to implement laws based on popular opinion, then who says that popular opinion is going to be moral? Who says that popular opinion is going to arrive at what is truly just? In fact, it's very easy to manipulate a population, and we see this throughout American history and even to this day. If you look at the way that mass media and social media and educational institutions are able to manipulate public opinion, you can see that public opinion is no check on uh, people's baser instincts. And in fact, popular opinion can lead a nation quite astray in terms of justice and morality. The thing is that democracy cannot be a substitute for morality. And this is where religion is so important. And this is where Islam as the truth, the religion of truth with true morality, God, our creator, Allah is sending guidance, sending rules on right and wrong and what is truly just. That can be a check on a government. If you have a standard, an objective standard, then that can be used as a check to basically identify whether a government or a leader is making decisions that are good or bad, just or unjust. You have to have that kind of objective standard. If you don't have that standard, as is the case with modern secular democracies, then there can be no check or balance. What we see today is that all three branches of government will for more, more or less have the same opinions on morality. It's just the popular uh, view of right and wrong. There is no independent standard to judge whether those views of morality are just or unjust, right or wrong. And so there's not really a check. Even though you have different branches of government, they can all collude, they can be all aligned, and there's not a true uh, standard to hold against and to judge them by. And that's why it's so easy for secular liberal demo democracies to commit atrocities and to commit all kinds of crimes that we see throughout their histories. So when we look at 
Islamic history, we see that this is not the case because the objective standard of morality is Islamic law. And who are the guardians of Islamic law and that objective standard of morality? It is the ulama. And the ulama were very careful not to involve themselves with the sultan, with the emir, with the khalifa, because there was this recognition that power can corrupt. And that if a scholar is too close to the sultan, then the sultan can negatively impact the scholar and corrupt the scholar to make religious rulings that benefit the sultan. And so this is a very, very strong check. It's a real check, unlike the superficial, fake kind of check that we find within uh, democratic systems. And so this distance between the ulama and the sultan is something that the, even the Prophet Sallallahu explicitly mentions because there's an authentic hadith narration from the Prophet Sallallahu where he says that as my servant approaches and gets closer to the sultan, he gets more and more distance from Allah. And so based on this hadith and many other uh, examples from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and his statements, as well as the practice of the Khulafa Rashidun, as well as the major scholars and ulama of history, they came to the conclusion that there needs to be a very big distance between the Sultan and the Alam. And so this is a real check and balance based on real morality. Because while it is the case that the Sultan, the Khalifa, he can be corrupt and he can uh, manipulate a, a population or manipulate an economy for his material gain. But there's always the Alim who is going to call that out and who is going to object to that kind of corruption and that abuse of power. And we see many examples of this within Islamic history where scholars were tortured, they were imprisoned, they were tortured, and sometimes were even killed because they opposed the Sultan. And so this is something that is very unique about Islamic history and Islamic governance. And it means that there is not this notion of separation of church and state within Islamic thought. No, the expectation was that the Khalifa, the Sultan, the Emir, he is going to implement Islamic law and he is going to rule according to Islamic ethics and jurisprudence. And you also have an entire system of governance based on that. But the bearers of the objective standard of morality is someone who is separate, people who are separate, the ulama, who are not involved directly with the Sultan and therefore are going to be prevented from the corrupting influence of power and money. That's a real check on power. That is a real check on corruption. And that is not something that we don't see within secular democracies. In secular democracies, it's just popular opinion. Fundamentally, there's a flaw there because who says that popular opinion is going to be right? In, in most cases, mob rule is very wrong. Mob rule is very unjust. And even if you put uh, limits on what the mob can do with, for example, a bill of rights uh, within your constitution, that's still a very uh, flaky, a very uh, intemperate, a very unreliable system of morality to, to base your entire government on. And that's why we see so many changes in what is considered right and wrong within Western history. Opinion about morality is constantly shifting. Popular views are constantly shifting. And that's why you have so many atrocities that continue to happen over and over again throughout the histories of modern Western liberal democratic governments. And so as Muslims, we need to recognize what it is. We need to call a spade a spade and recognize that we have a better system within our tradition. Yeah, we have uh, wars in our history. We have uh, corrupt leaders. That's true. But you also have a, a morality. You have the Sharia. You have Islamic law that provides that anchor that keeps us uh, as 
um, as a ummah on the straight path and understanding what is just. And that is true guidance from Allah. And this is a big uh, ni'mah that we have to recognize and not have this kind of inferiority, inferiority complex thinking that other people, other nations, just philosophers from a particular part of the world have understood justice and morality and government better than the Quran, better than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.